So uh, with those preliminaries, so I'm, I'm violating some sort of rule or taboo here. Um, this is the second time in just over six months I've had the good fortune to do an interview with Jennifer Egan. Um, I have, uh, I have uh, bottomless interest in her, but I'm slightly worried she's going to get bored with me. Impossible. Uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're going to do our best. Um, the other one, if you're curious, by the way, was in a series I do called Conversations with Slate. And we did four, uh, uh, four relatively short video segments from that interview delving into aspects of Jennifer's work. Um, and as I say, we're going, to, we're going to talk in some detail about a visit from the, the Goon Squad, uh, which I have here. And uh, you know, one of the things about, about this book is that I don't know anybody who disliked it. You can get an argument going at any di dinner party if you just say, Jonathan Franzen. And at least somebody will take the contrary position. But I've yet to, you don't have to respond to this, but I've yet to find anybody who read this and wasn't impressed by it. So, I'd love to know how I did that because I would like to do that every time. <laughs> I have no idea why that is. I've marveled at it too. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people who don't like it, but it's, I, I, I don't know. I feel like there was some invisible inoculation um, that I, I managed to insert into this book without knowing it. And I just, I think it was just sheer luck. Uh, or maybe it was, it was sort of fragmented and chaotic enough that there was something for everyone. I don't know. But it, it, is, it is a great surprise and certainly has not been my experience before. So I, I <laughs> wish I had the formula, but I think it was accidental. Yes, well, enjoy it while it lasts. The, um, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I will say that, that among those who, who loved your book, just to warm us up a little bit here, were the, uh, was the Pulitzer Prize Committee. And uh, this year, they didn't love any book enough to award a prize. So just to completely put you on the spot and ask you to do something slightly impolitic, what would you have given the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction to in 2012? You know, I, I feel like I actually can't answer that mm -hmm. only because I, j I did not read comprehensively um, new fiction in that year. Um, I, I was a, a National Book Awards judge two years ago, and I, you know, having read everything that year, I felt a need to kind of move away from contemporary stuff. So I, I read, you know, here and there and read some things that I really enjoyed, but I don't feel like I read enough to say this one was the best. I mean, one book I'll mention purely because I think it hasn't gotten any real attention, and, and I think it deserved a lot, um, was a book called Butterfly's Child by Angela Davis Gardner, which is just a spectacular historical novel um, taking off from the Puccini, where the Puccini opera ends um, with Butterfly's mixed race child coming back to America with his um, white father. And she, it's just, it's really wonderful. I could not put it down, and I thought it was tremendous. Yeah. So I'll, I'll plug, I'll take this opportunity to plug that, not having read widely enough to say anything so more. So the, the nominees this year were, were Dennis Johnson, Train Dreams, Karen Russell's book Swamplandia, and David Foster Wallace's posthumously published and un, not quite finished, The Pale King. Um, what do, you, do you have any sense of what the, the committee was saying by not choosing from among those three finalists? Was it saying that none of these books are broad enough in their appeal the way yours was? Or were they, I don't know, I was sort of mystified by it. You know, I, do, I really don't know. I mean, yeah. so it's pure speculation. Um, I mean, I think there's a kind of built-in possibility of this happening just due to the nature of the structure of the Pulitzer Prize. So for example, with the National Book Awards, there are five judges, they pick five finalists, and you know, Obviously, they've had enough agreement to make that decision together. But with the Pulitzers, there are three judges. They pick three finalists, and then it goes to the board, which had no part in picking those finalists. Right. So it seems like every year, or often, some category goes empty as a result of that. And this year, it was editorial writing as well. Yeah. I think it, it seemed to cause a lot more of a stir when it was fiction than when it was one of the newsier categories. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but anyway, I mean, so I don't know. Was it that there was not a majority, which I know is required? I, I mean, if I had to just guess, I would say that there was, it was, it was that structural possibility playing out, which is that there's a gap in taste between what the board is looking for and what the judges came up with. But I'm guessing that everyone felt pretty rotten about it because, you know, it doesn't, it, it, there's this huge apparatus that kicks in when you win a prize like this, which is quite amazing. And, 
you know, someone could have enjoyed that this year and they won't. And I, I can't imagine anyone feels very good about it. I have to guess that they tried to avoid this outcome really hard yeah. and for whatever reason weren't able to. But I, I do think, it, I, I would hesitate to say that it was a, a bigger comment. I think my guess is for whatever reason, they could not pick one of these three. Uh, yes, I mean, they're inscrutable. They don't say why, but there is a, the Pulitzer does make a point unlike some other awards of being, having generalists who make the final choice. The people who vote, w to pick among the finalists are not writers necessarily or literary people. And there does seem to be this persistent issue about whether there is liter too much literature is, is written for other writers and is speaking within a community as opposed to speaking to the wider society. And clearly the Pulitzer thinks of its role as singling out works that speak to society. You know, I to my mind, all three of those finalists would fall would would satisfy that criterion. So I don't I mean, again, this is we're kind of it's criminology, mm -hmm. but you know, I, did they sit there and say none of these fulfills that criterion? I, I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I really don't. It would I wish we could find out. <laughs> all right, well you know. gave you gave your Pulitzer, so so let's move on. <laughs> so I realized that one of the things I didn't ask you when we spoke last time is who is Peter M and why did you dedicate the book to him? You know, you are killing me with these questions. <laughs> I feel I really should have had a warning. That's all right. um, I am going to just come out I and answer that. I can't be the first to ask you. You know, you practically are, and it's so <laughs> funny that you're asking me on a stage, but whatever. Here I am in New York. Um, it is my longtime therapist. There you go. Here I am. Like. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, how can I not answer it? I, can I refuse to answer it? I guess I could have, but that would have been even more intriguing. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's a, a wonderful person who I think really helped me a lot over many years. And somehow, especially because the book opens, you know, with a, a chapter in which someone is both in therapy and, you know, undergoing an experience, I, I guess, and, and also because I guess it's the nature of therapy to sort of look at your life over time and see what kinds of patterns emerge um, in doing so. It just seemed like the right moment to honor this person that I, I really feel I owe a lot. That's very nice. Well, that doesn't put you in a very small category in New York. <laughs> I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. It's, so, the character Sasha, which is part of what I want to talk about in this book, she is in therapy through part of the book. I know that, that much of what you write about is drawn in various elliptical ways from experience of yours. I mean, is, that, is, the, is the therapy modeled on what you have experienced? Um, I, I guess to some degree. I mean, in no way is caused the therapist that I made up like mine exactly, but he's also not a major character. Right. Um, I, I guess, you know, to some degree, yes. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, a little inscrutable, um, not providing a lot of details about his own life. It's not the kind of, I mean, I hear about therapy where people are like exchanging book recommendations and recipes and it, my therapy wasn't really <laughs> like that. Um, so, so yes, in it's, in it's rough outlines, I would say yes. Yeah. So um, some people have used the term experimental to describe this book. I don't, I don't think that's, it doesn't feel experimental to me, but it is very unusual in form in that it has, uh, it's made up of discrete stories which can stand on their own, yet which fit together in various ways. But the chronology and the characters are very complicated in terms of who shows up where, when, and how you put the pieces together. Um, so I just want to ask you first, t t talk to us a little bit about what kind of novel it is and how you saw it when you were working on it. Well, I'm always, I'm still reluctant to use the word novel um, when I talk about the book. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. I, and, and with the hardback, I didn't even have it, it on the cover. Yeah, it, yeah, because I was worried that it, it wouldn't kind of fulfill people's expectations of what a novel was. And so by calling it a novel, we might cause people to dislike it who might otherwise have liked it if they weren't expecting it to be a novel. Yeah. Um, however, when the hardback basically didn't sell for the first four months, um, the publisher <laughs> informed me that we were actually going to call it a novel in the paperback, and it wasn't really a question, it was just a fact. Well, so I must um, have a first edition here. So it doesn't say novel. None of the, none of the uh, hardbacks do. Okay, yeah. Um, so anyway, so I, basically, I mean, because the writing of the book was in a way sort of accidental, I, and this, this is not normal for me. Usually I, I do realize I'm writing a book when I start a book, but with this one, because I was kind of avoiding a different book, 
and just started writing what I thought were a few stories to kind of entertain me while I stalled on writing this other book. By the time I realized that it was a book, certain basic decisions had already been made. I think this is the perfect way to write books, I've decided, but it seems to be impossible <laughs> to replicate. I feel like, can't I just suddenly be writing a book and already know what kind of book it is? Um, but anyway, sort of the most, you know, quote unquote, experimental aspects of it were already true by that point, which were, you know, each, each chapter was about a different person. There's certainly nothing experimental about that. I think the only thing that, that maybe is unusual, really, is that um, the chapters don't feel like they're part of one book. There's not that uniformity of tone and mood that, that we often find in so-called linked story collections. And I guess, in my mind, well, first of all, that was already true when I decided it was a book. And I was enjoying that aspect of it, so I thought, let's continue with this. But I think, too, my feeling was, if it's going to be in parts, why not make the parts as different from each other as possible? It just seemed more interesting. You know, you lose a lot when you give up the kind of central access, the, the central orientation of a novel. There's a danger of fragmentation and a lack of momentum, and you know, you're asking people to start over again and again. But at the same time, it seemed like one possible advantage that I, I wouldn't have otherwise was a much greater array of tones and, and modes, let's say. And I guess I, I felt like, why not run, why not get, ha have it be tragic and farcical? To try to encompass all of that in one book seemed fun. Yeah. It, it sounds like a very organic process in terms of how the, the book em emerged. Was there, at, at what point was there a structure, an outline in your head of how, how the book would unfold? Well, there was a structure early on. It turned out to be the wrong structure, but it did make me feel like I was working in, a, in a, an organized fashion. Um, and that was, again, determined by the way those first three stories that I wrote had emerged, which was going backward in time. So I thought, OK, it's a book that goes backward. Not a new idea. Charles yeah. Baxter did it beautifully. Um, and Martin Amist has done it, and I'm sure many others. Um, but I thought, that's OK. I think it's, it's cool. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, so that was what I thought as I worked. I didn't write them in a backwards order, but I assumed that that's how they would read. And then one of, uh, I had a real shock when I read it through in that order, kind of close to the time that I thought it was done, and discovered that it was actually really flat. Like, it, it didn't gather momentum at all. You know, the hope was that each piece would have its own pleasures and payoffs, and then on top of that, there would be a kind of combustion, was how I hoped it would be, um, when all of them were juxtaposed, and, you know, a, a kind of chemical reaction would occur. And, it, and, and the whole would be more than the sum of the parts, which is obviously what you hope for in any book. But what I found when I read it through backwards was that that was not true at all. It was actually the opposite. It, it lost energy. Um, and later chapters just seemed bad because we were sort of not moving in an energetic way toward them. So at that point, I realized that you know, maybe I hoped my backward structure was the problem because that meant it could be solved. And I noticed that there were a lot of ways in which this backwards movement was actually undercutting a lot of the surprises for the reader, or, and also just kind of satisfactions of curiosity. So for example, in chapter two, a music producer named Benny um, briefly recalls his years as a punk rocker. It, it literally passes in two sentences in San Francisco. Well, that, the time to hit the reader with the chapter in which we see him doing that would ideally be right away when they were that you know, the memory of those two sentences is still exists in the reader's mind. But in my backwards order, we had to get from 2006 uh -huh. to 1979, and it took like eight chapters. So then by the time the reader got there, there was no memory of any of that, and it just sort of felt like, huh, OK. Um, so that was, that was a, a structural idea that had to go, but it but did then, orient me. You then sort of reshuffled the deck. I mean, you had these, these somewhat modular pieces, and putting them in a different order significantly changed the, the feel of the book and the, you think the interest of the book. I hoped it would. I wasn't yeah. totally sure it would, but I, I guess what I felt was that since I had, what had really led me through the writing of it was my own curiosity, kind of moving from one thing to the next. What I felt was that that actually had to happen for the reader too, and that my sense of gauging that curiosity and satisfying that curiosity had to be my guiding principle in organizing it, and not any notion about chronology. Huh. So if, if someone read it in a different order than the one you presented, 
how different do you think the experience would be? Would, would that be okay? I mean, would the, is this order absolutely essential to it now, do you think? I think, it's, I, I think I can say pretty authoritatively that it would not be as good. Uh -huh. But, you know, people can do what they want, of course. <laughs> um, in, in the UK, there, there's actually an app for the ebook version of this that has a shuffle feature. <laughs> and um, and I, I was a little worried about that because I said, you know, I don't want anyone shuffling this thing until they've read it. So supposedly <laughs> they have to read it my way first. But, you know, before you're allowed to remix doubt. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a very interesting idea. But there, there, some of these chapters seem to me to stand particularly well on their own. That is, if you took them out, and I guess for me they tend to be the things that I remember most from the book, my favorite chapters, but the safari. Um, which did you, was that published separately? They all were except the last two. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that was actually, I mean, I had three rules as I moved forward through the book after I finally realized I was writing a book. One was that each chapter would be about a different person. One was that it would have this different mood and tone and feel. And the third was that it would stand completely on its own. Because, I, you know, I'm asking the reader to start over every time in a way. So just in terms of symmetry, it seemed appropriate that there would be a total payoff every time. So that was the goal. I mean, if I, if I felt like something couldn't stand on its own, it, it, that, was, that was a bad sign. Yeah. Um, it, and so they, they all pretty much do, even the last two, I think. Yeah. Um, but as you say, some, some maybe more strongly than others. Ta talking about the jumbled chronology, um, we've just been talking about the sort of later processes of the book when you'd written the bulk of it and then re rearranged it. Take us back to the very first instinct that produced the book. I mean, was there, a, it, was there a moment or an image or what was it? What did this book for you, what seeded it? Where did it come from? Well, in a way, there are two answers to that. And I usually only talk about one of them. But if, if, if the whole, if, I guess if the point of this really is to kind of get into the yeah. deep craft issues. And we've already talked about your psychiatrist, yeah. so you might as well go. Why well, hold yeah. back? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the thing is that actually there were four chapters that I had written years before, and they had nothing to do with each other. And they were just four stories. I had published all of them. Um, one was in Harper's, one was in Tin House. Um, and I had often thought, you know, what will I do with these? It kind of bothered me that I didn't really feel like I was going to write a story collection. And I, it, I just felt like I wanted them to have some sort of life in a book, but I didn't know what that book would be. Once I found myself you know, inadvertently moving into writing these other stories, I began fairly quickly to feel ways in which they could connect to these earlier four, which in a way was really odd because the earlier four couldn't have been more different from and each other. And were connected to each other in any way. Not even way. slightly. Yeah. But the feeling, the metaphor that I've used in it, it really kind of was like this, was this sense of these islands that were completely far apart and beginning to sense a kind of landmass under them that connected all of them. It was actually a very exciting process. A lot of it took place in the shower, oddly. <laughs> I mean, for some reason, that was the place where I felt like I could make connections. And one of the, it's sort of strange, one of the older pieces um, was the one called Goodbye My Love, which is um, where Sasha is a runaway in Naples and her uncle comes to find her and she steals his wallet. And the thing that's so strange about it was that I had then written the first chapter of this in which a woman takes a wallet never once thinking of that earlier story. Huh. And I, I had to change very, very little other than the name of the character. It was just clearly Sasha. To make her the kleptomaniac. But exactly. when you wrote the first story, she was not a kleptomaniac in Naples. No, it was she just steals this wallet as yeah. part of her you know, encounter with her uncle. So those kinds of connections would occur. And it was really exciting. I really had this sense of something larger than I was taking shape, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Was it really the, the characters who, that connected the stories at that stage? Um, yes, yeah. I would say so. But it, another thing that's interesting, like another character that we meet in a few chapters in this book is called Lou, who's a very, you know, a, a, a problematic kind of reckless music producer. Um, I had already, one of the other four that I had written is called You Plural, which is Lou on his deathbed, basically, with these women visiting him, and who he clearly has a lot of history with. And so I, I saw Lou that way before I ever knew him as a younger man, um, which, is, which is odd. I think if you read the book, you would really not expect that. Um, but it, it, was, it had an odd backwards kind of 
uh, it moved in a crab-like way, this book. It, did, it was, it sort of, um, there was nothing linear about the way it was made. And I guess that's kind of reflected in, in the way it reads. Yeah. So talk about um, Sasha as a character and, and how she emerged. Because, you know, it's, it's, she's, I mean, I guess she's the, the, the biggest character in the book, right? Sasha and I Benny. I would say it's Benny, too. Yeah, yeah. Sasha and Benny. But, but you, get these, you get these pieces of her at very different parts in her life when she's arguably a very different person. You get her when she's living in Naples and is kind of a sort of prostitute and has sort of gotten in all sorts of trouble as a young woman. You then get her back in New York when she's working at Benny. You get her in therapy, I guess, at a later stage. And then you get her when she's uh, living off in the desert later when she ha has a family. How did, how did you think about Sasha? You know, it's, that's one of the harder questions for me to answer just generally about character yeah. because I don't, I definitely, I don't use anyone I know. Yeah. So somehow I seem to come up with people, in fact, I'm really bad at trying to use people I know. I wish I could use them, but I'm sure most people I know are happy that I can't. Um, <laughs> but I, I seem to go kind of cold when I, when I have yeah. an actual corollary in reality as a person. Places, times, that those I can use, but people I can't. Um, so, I mean, Sasha basically came to me, I guess, you know, she had in some way, I had been interested in someone like her at that earlier point when I wrote Goodbye My Love. But, you know, the real inception of the book was seeing a wallet in a bathroom and when I was having dinner with my mom at the Regency Hotel uh -huh. and thinking, and, and having, having a long history of being robbed, which is kind of typical of me. I love to, to take the other side of, of a, an encounter that I know very well, <laughs> we're all too well. Um, and so seeing this wall, it kind of brought back a number of thefts that I've experienced. Um, one in particular in which um, the thief actually phoned me posing as a Citibank employee after stealing the wallet and actually got me to give her my PIN number. <laughs> which was really a drag <laughs> because at that point she not only had my wallet but she actually got hold of everything I had in my checking account and because I had actually spent you know like 10 minutes on the telephone with this person and actually wept during that process about my sadness about having been robbed and received her apparent sympathy for how difficult it was to go through such a thing um, I found myself a little obsessed with her for a while after that, and I kept thinking, you know, who was she? And for some reason, the particular issue that, that really attracted me was like, did she actually feel any sympathy? I really wanted yeah. to know the answer to that. <laughs> whether, um, whether it's like a good actor, she really had to play the part. Exactly, or, yeah, yeah. I, maybe, I don't know. Maybe yeah. it was some weird effort to- Is she a to... method criminal? Or just... <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I think somehow in seeing that wallet and having a brief fantasy of taking it, because there it was, you know, it just so vulnerably exposed, um, I reconnected with my interest in a thief of long before and decided to just write from that moment. And I didn't know anything about this thief at all, other than that she would be female and take the wallet in a lady's room. And then all these things about Sasha emerged very spontaneously. I mean, the most radical of which really is the idea that she's not taking the wallet out of need, but really out of a kind of compulsion. Yeah. That sort of came to me in the moment. And I, I don't know anything about kleptomania, actually. I don't know if that's really the way it works. Although no one has stepped forward to say that I got it totally wrong. So I, I have to assume that it, maybe it's not completely unlike what that is. Um, but you know, the fact that Sasha was in therapy and other kind of basic things about her just seemed to emerge kind of naturally. And so then it was just a matter of, of thinking about that person at, at different times. A lot of that history was, was already contained in, in the present that I described with the wallet. We know her father's disappeared. Um, I, I, you know, at, not, not for a while, but at some point I realized that I actually did have another piece about her as a younger person. The last thing to fall into place was her future. And I really wanted so badly to write about that, especially because I already had a chapter about Benny, the other main character, in his future. And I didn't like the thought of not letting us see Sasha. But I couldn't figure out a way to get to her because of my rule about writing about someone more than once. Although two other times I tried to write about Sasha unsuccessfully. In one, she actually finds her father. Um, and that was, I thought that would be so exciting, but it was actually really unsuccessful. I, I couldn't make it work at all. 
Um, and then another one, uh, she is in college, and it, and it was from her point of view, but that, that didn't work, and it, it morphed very gradually into a chapter called Out of Body. Huh. So anyway, I guess the answer is, I feel like with character more than almost anything, it has to feel kind of spontaneous, and I have to feel like the, the few things I'm saying about a person suggest another real, a larger reality that feels coherent. Um, I, I feel like I can, I, you know, I, right now I'm struggling with a, with a new book and what I'm finding is that often I don't have that sense of the larger whole that's suggested by a couple of details about someone and, and I really need to have that. Yeah. That's sort of how it works for me. Um, but, uh, but the decisions about character feel pretty organic. But it's a, uh, you, you said the b b number of things I want to pick up on that was so interesting. But with, with Sasha and Benny, because you get them at these very different points in their lives when they are very, seem like very different people, I wonder how that works in a way you had to go through the process of the character's development, including all the stuff that you don't show. So living with a character, developing a character, you're actually dealing with several different characters and concealing the connective tissue in between, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, not just with character, but in every aspect of this book, there was always a sense of um, needing to kind of start fresh and yet maintain the sense of connective tissue to other parts of the book, which all of which, at least for me, felt ideally suggested by whatever details were there. I could feel this larger hole around it, which isn't to say that I didn't bumble and fumble, because I really did. And there were things I still am annoyed that I couldn't pull off. But, you know, I was trying to find a way to, you know, through ideally the minimum, because it's all about compression, really, um, just evoke something larger, and then once I felt it there, I felt content to move on. I just wanted to make to to bring it into being, even somewhat invisibly, yeah. and not have to spell it all out. All right. Something else you just said. You didn't you didn't make a point of learning anything about kleptomania. I've heard you say things like that a lot, as in I don't actually know anything about music. I don't know anything about this, and. You, of course, anyone reading the book would think you had actually spent a lot of time intently studying and learning about these things or that you already knew about them. How, how do you feel about that? I mean, there's some novelists who, you know, who take that kind of verisimilitude very seriously and would, if they were going to write about kleptomania, they were going to make sure they understood what kleptomaniacs did and didn't do and who they were and weren't. Well, I, if I were going to call it kleptomania, right. I would certainly research it exhaustively. Oh, that's but interesting. The term never occurred. No, to me. because yes. I, maybe that's not what she has. Right. You know, I mean, I, I guess I'm, first of all, very reluctant to ever diagnose characters yeah. because I feel like there's <laughs> nothing in it for me. I mean, the point of. <laughs> well, they're all yours. You can do whatever you want to them. <laughs> the point of diagnosis is to medicate, and I really don't have to deal with that aspect <laughs> of their lives, thank God. <laughs> so people often ask me, you know, well, gee, is so and so, you know, um, bipolar, for example? Moose in Look at Me. I'm asked that a lot. But I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in the way his mind works, but I, I'm not his doctor, so I don't really know. So um, <laughs> with kleptomania, that's why I didn't research it. The music stuff, I, I absolutely did. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, to the extent that I needed to. The punk rock scene in San Francisco, I, I had memories of. Um, but even that, I, I shored up with, with some research. And then, you know, I mean, most of the, the music research came in in just that second chapter, which I wrote still not even knowing it was a book, um, which is Benny, the music producer, just going through his day. It's amazing how much you actually do need to know to just show a person at work. Yeah. I mean, that's... And, and I would never try to fake that. Oh, that's feel never, better now. I would never get away with it. Um, no, I spent hours on the telephone with a, guy, a mixer who was amazingly helpful. I mean, I didn't even understand the difference between analog and digital recording. I really knew nothing. And the thing that was so great about talking to him was uh, he answered my technical questions, but in the course of that, he gave me a sense of how, I mean, I just listened to the words he used and the phrases and certain parts of the nomenclature of his business. And I think above all, I had such a sense, a vivid sense of the 
before and after feeling that really permeates the music industry, before being, before the music industry went into a free fall, and after being now, and, and you know, dating back several years, in which the industry is trying to figure out how it's gonna function in a digital world. And I think the poignancy of that really affected me. And, and I think that's one reason that music ended up being so important in the book. Huh. So the, the research, I think, brought some of that about. Jennifer, one of the most striking chapters of, of, for the, of the book for a lot of people who read it is the, the one that you wrote in PowerPoint, um, which is, I, I guess, told in the voice of, of Sasha's daughter uh, at the later stage in life. And she's, she's essentially telling you the story of the family and the, the brother who has some disability, some emotional disability. Um, how, did, how did that come to you as a, as a creative idea? Um, it, it, very circuitously in a way. I mean, I started with a strong desire to work in PowerPoint, and that actually arose, uh, I remember specifically, in the election um, in the summer of 08 when the Obama campaign suddenly pulled ahead. There was a lot of talk about how and why that had happened. And repeatedly, a particular PowerPoint presentation within the campaign was cited. And all my reaction to this was PowerPoint. It was like a light bulb. I thought, I have to write fiction in PowerPoint. Yeah. Now, I had, I, did not, I had never used PowerPoint. And I honestly was not entirely sure what it was. I, mean, <laughs> I knew that it resulted in, you know, people putting bullet points in front of other people. But I, I wasn't quite sure what the organizing principle of it was. And so to find out, I, I reached out to some friends in the corporate world and said, I'm, I'm so eager to learn more about what you do. Um, do you have any PowerPoints? And so they, they sent them, at which point I discovered that I actually didn't even own PowerPoint. And, uh, and didn't have enough laptop, uh, memory on my laptop to, um, to, to hold it. So at that point, I thought, OK, you know what? This is just getting way too complicated. I'm going to do it by hand. So my first PowerPoint attempt, because I do write fiction by hand generally, was that I drew rectangles on, on yellow, on legal paper, and sat down sort of waiting for, for lightning you to like strike. You storyboarded it. Yeah. Kind of, but I, I'm not actually that. I, I, it didn't work at all, yeah. suffice it to say. I kept, I kept veering into prose. So, I, I thought I was giving up on it, but then I, the idea kept intriguing me. So I finally actually bought memory, bought the program, started working in it. And I, another big problem with PowerPoint, which I immediately saw, was that it, of course, feels very corporate and kind of cold. It's not an inviting form. It doesn't right, I mean, really anybody think, would have said it's the enemy of literature. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's not, it, it, it doesn't really, it's, it's a vibe kill, let's yeah. say. Um, <laughs> So my thought was, well, but I wasn't even worrying about that. I just thought, why does someone tell a story in PowerPoint? That's yeah. a big question if you're going to write something in PowerPoint. So I came up with an answer that I thought was great, but the problem was it was, it was way too obvious, which was a corporate person might tell their story in PowerPoint. So I had a, um, a corporate person telling a story in PowerPoint. And, it, and of course, this did not solve the problem of it feeling very corporate. In fact, it actually made it much worse. So mm -hmm. that went nowhere, too. So I was kind of giving up. I mean, I sold the book without a PowerPoint. And um, <laughs> I was uh, upset about it, but I was obviously the only one who felt the lack of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, but there was actually another problem, which we touched on earlier, which was that I also hadn't found a way to visit Sasha in her future. I couldn't seem to get to her. I couldn't find a way to do it that was fresh, because I was very sure that I had pretty much exhausted all of the kind of conventional narrative approaches that I had access to. And then all of a sudden it came to me that maybe one of her kids could narrate it, and then it wouldn't feel so corporate. So after I sold the book without telling my editor, who was expecting light revisions, I went into a PowerPoint <laughs> frenzy. And that's pretty much all I did all summer to the horror of my family. Um, because I, of course, I didn't even know how to use the program, so there was a very steep learning curve. I mean, at first I was just doing a lot of bullet points, but you know, you get to realize PowerPoint is a lot more than that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, once I was actually working in PowerPoint, I think I began to finally understand why I had wanted to do it. Because before it was just a, a desire that I thought was driven by a need for new forms, but in fact, 
there were, there were even better reasons than that. I mean, PowerPoint is, is sort of a microcosm of the way the book as a whole works. It's discrete moments separated by pauses. That's all it is. It's 50% pauses. And the book is kind of the same thing. I mean, there are all these gaps in the book. I had another obsession that I had been trying to work into the book unsuccessfully, which was pauses in songs. Yeah. That had come it's about. A great that I had come about, um, come upon that in some of my research of the music industry. A fantastic book called "So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star" by Jacob Schlichter of the band Semisonic, whose mega hit from 1998 is called "Closing Time," and it has a pause. <laughs> and so um, he described the the insertion of this pause into the song. And for some reason, as soon as I read that, I thought, "That's amazing. That's so interesting." Um, so I had tried to work in pauses in songs, but it actually wasn't that easy. I mean, I had an academic writing a book about it in another failed chapter. Anyway, once I was in PowerPoint, suddenly it, it became easy to deal with that topic. Um, and so I think there's a way in which just structurally it made sense in this book. It also, something I didn't think about but was pointed out later, it functions as a kind of classic pause in the book itself. It's close to the end, it's an interruption of the narrative flow of a sort, but then the narrative flow resumes. So I think that, that you know, all of those reasons made me interested. Um, and, I, and one final thing I would say about it is that it's actually very hard to write fiction in PowerPoint because it, it <laughs> makes, I mean, it's, it feels corporate and all that, but also it's very hard to represent action with PowerPoint because there's no continuity. So a lot of the things we rely on in fiction become almost impossible to do. And, um, but I think that the chapter that I ended up writing in PowerPoint would have been really unsuccessful written in a conventional way because it's very sentimental, first of all, and very little actually happens. But because of the coldness of PowerPoint and the um, atomized nature yes. of it, it actually allowed me to tell this very sweet story that I don't think I could have gotten away with otherwise. Because it's descriptive of a, of a moment in time as opposed to an unfolding plot line. Yeah, I, and, and it's so cold that, yeah. that you can get very sweet without it cloying the way it would in conventional prose. Yes, well, no one can ever write a chapter in PowerPoint again or a novel. It's, you, you, you'll be the first and last to do that. Well, I, I include myself in the group who will not attempt it because <laughs> once was enough. <laughs> So when you talk about this process, you're, you're very witty talking about it, and it all seems to take on this air of ine inevitability. But uh, I know that you, you have talked about finding this process very, very hard. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which writing, this creative process, this part of the process, not the, not the sitting there and just doing it every day, but the, but the, but, but the more expansive part of it. It challenges you and is difficult. I think the thing that's the most challenging for me is that I really don't know. I don't have a clear plan when I start, and therefore, I really, on some level, I'm I'm basically incompetent at the beginning. I mean, I, I don't. I, I know that I haven't done it before because if I feel like I've done it before, then I don't really want to do it. Um, I feel a kind of aversion to it. But I often have a sense that it just will be a disaster. Um, I really felt this most with my novel, Look at Me, which was such a departure for me. And it is a pretty weird book. I think it's actually more experimental than Goon Squad in certain ways. And I remember with that one really thinking, this is just not allowed. I mean, people are going to be, they're going to think I'm crazy. Um, so there was a sense of, um, of not knowing what I was doing and and when it, what, when it was going well, and this is always true, there's a kind of private thrill in just the sense of doing something that's fun and working. But of course, there are many times when it isn't like that. And in those times, I would feel in a kind of free fall. Um, with Goon Squad, I guess the corollary was the, the question, I mean, I knew I had some pieces that w had strengths, but the big question was, would the whole amount to anything? And I would feel very worried when, when I felt that it wouldn't. And when I had parts that I, I couldn't make work, the implications of, first of all, it's just horrible to, to, to not be able to make something work. It's, it's, it's like viscerally unpleasant. I, I feel like it makes me very depressed when my writing's not going well. I feel like there's a, a way in which 
writing well is like a kind of a deep pulse that I need to feel happening to just feel at ease in the world. So there's already the problem of not having that, which is a drag. But with this, with, with Goon Squad, it, there would be a kind of added fear, which was that my big plan just wasn't going to work. You know, if this piece couldn't work, then maybe the whole thing couldn't work. So it's always this question about whether it will work or just be a failure. And then, you know, if you really have a kind of catastrophic imagination like I do, you know, you can, you can bundle all kinds of things, all kinds of consequences into that failure. Um, so for example, with Look at Me, because I had actually waited to have children until that book was done, when I would think it was really bad, I would think, oh my god, and now I also haven't had children. <laughs> and now my husband's probably going to actually divorce me, because what if I can't have children? And so it would all snowball into a real picture of disaster. Yeah. Um, and then with The Keep, I had actually then had two children. But I would think, like, oh my god, this is the first new book I've written since I had children, and I'm now I'm a terrible writer. <laughs> so all I can do now is have children. I've like, I've, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, and I, and I can already feel with this new one that it's going to be, you know, oh my God, I, I won a prize and now it's totally ruined my writing ability. Like, I can't do it. Now all I am just a has-been. So whatever, you know, you find all kinds of ways yeah. to, we find ways to torture <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> but I don't know, for some reason I, 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 I find that kind of insecurity you're talking about sort of essential to good writing. I mean, you know, we all know bad writers and they're usually a lot more confident than good writers, <laughs> right? Uh, well, in my case, I was most confident about a book that um, my first attempt at a novel, I thought it was a novel, um, which I had, which no one had read. I was working in a vacuum. And, um, and in retrospect, I sort of hadn't read it either. Um, I mean, I had written it, <laughs> and it looked really good across the room, all you know, printed out and stacked up. But um, I felt a, a real confidence. And, and when I imagined coming to New York with this thing, I sort of, I imagined a kind of ascension. I thought I would sort of arrive and <laughs> things would just happen and, and this book would be the thing that would make them happen. And I mean, the reality really could not have been further from that. It was a disaster. When I would send it to people, they would become unreachable. Um, uh. Friends, you know, eluded me. My mother briefly eluded me um, because no one knew what to say because it was unreadably bad. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, that was my one, uh, it was my one bout of confidence. It didn't get me too far. So. <laughs> yeah. But at, at what point do you give up on something that's not working? I mean, as opposed to then, now, I mean, if, you, to, if you're a little bit objective about it, you know you're capable of writing very well. But sometimes there are these things, like you talked about the chapter where Sasha fought, meets her father, that you gave up on it. At what point do you say, I'm, go I'm, I'm not going to try anymore? It's such a good question. Um, I think that the way it seems to work with me is I keep trying and trying because sometimes th something cannot work and then suddenly I can find a way to make it work. So I, I try not to give up so early that I haven't allowed time for that to occur. Um, but I think wh one of the big, um, I, 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 sort of the pivot of those decisions are, is often just the question of whether I actually am interested anymore. If I really feel uninterested and unwilling, that's, I think, a sign that no matter what I do, it's probably not going to work. And I, I have a writing group that I rely on pretty heavily, uh, some peers um, that we meet fairly regularly. I often bring in things in a very raw state when they're kind of bad by any standard. But the question I'm, I'm interested in is just sort of, does it feel alive? And I've had experiences of, I actually remember this happening um, with the chapter that I was trying to write about Sasha in college from her point of view, where I brought it in. and. They were very nice about it. I mean, they were, they were actually interested in it. They felt like there was stuff I could do with it. But I walked out of there feeling like I, I was finished. So something, I felt a kind of exhaustion, a lack of excitement about problem solving that, I, that it, to me was a sign that there was just, I was never going to get there. And I had, other, I had several other chapters like oh. that. Um, but it, it's, and, and, and I, I don't have any regrets about, about any of that. Um, although it, it, I still think that I might find ways to come at some of that material differently. Um, but certainly what I was doing wasn't working. And I wasn't interested. Yeah. 
So you, you have a writer's group. It's a kind of non-academically based workshop with other writers who read each other's work? Yeah. So we've, we've, in some form or another, we've been meeting for like 20 years, some really? of us. Yeah. 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 It started as a class, actually, where we were all paying someone to be the kind of leader. And then at a certain point, she wanted to bring work in. So that, at that point, we all felt including her that there was really no reason for us to be paying her and so we we you know stopped that part and we've just met as a group and you know people have come and gone but i think the essential part of the process is that we don't look at anything on a page it's all um it's all oral we just read aloud really? and um part of that is you know there's no homework there's no kind of reading late at night and then as much as anything trying to sound like you read it more carefully than you did or any of that it's just we just all have the experience in the moment and we all react yeah. and there's a kind of it's amazing what what good triage that that allows for you know it's it's hard to get caught up in little things when you're just hearing something for the first time and having to take a few notes and respond so i rely very heavily on them and to some degree it really is the legacy of that experience of writing in a vacuum for two years and getting so completely off the track. I just don't want to ever have that happen again. Are they all professional writers? Um, more or less, uh -huh. yes, but in different areas. Playwright, poet, um, just, you know, someone who works more on essays. Um, but we're, we're a, quirky, a quirky little group. What's the etiquette like? I mean, how does one say now to Jennifer Egan, you know, I didn't like that or... <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I, it, would be, it would be terrible if one couldn't say that. I mean, uh. the group would kind of not function anymore. I think the key, as with any workshop, is really um, uh, to be on someone's side deeply in the sense of really wanting them to succeed. And I feel a kind of, I feel a pride in what they do because I feel like I kind of helped from the start. So th there's almost a proprietary feeling that starts to emerge, which I think is good, which is we all have a stake in this stuff working. On the other hand, you don't want mom saying, you know, it's great. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's that, it's the, the um, finding that balance between general support, but specific, you know, honesty and willingness to say, say the truth. Huh. You're a very disciplined writer, aren't you? I have that sense. In the sense um, of regular hours, you know. It doesn't, I, I would say not as much as you might think. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I can be, let's say. I, I feel that I've been much less so in the last year. Um, I, and maybe it's probably because I feel like my job became more selling than anything else, but I feel, um, I feel a little undisciplined at the moment. I do. I mean, I can be, let's say. And when things are going well, I generally am. Um, sometimes it's the hardest to be disciplined when I'm casting about. Um, but even then, you know, five to seven pa handwritten pages a day, even if it's just flailing, is, I guess, a kind of discipline. And, um, and I, I do try to do that. I want to open this up in a minute, but I just want to ask you before we do to talk about the creative process around your next book, which you mentioned you're working on. We've been talking about something that's been finished for a long time. That's at a stage where presumably its, it's shape is not fully clear. Tell us a little bit about where you are with it and how it's going. Um, okay, I mean, uh, I guess, I guess it, you know, I, I did write one thing after Goon Squad, um, which, which is about a character from it, um, which I felt very good about and which is structurally kind of radical, but I knew that that wasn't a new book. I'd had this long-standing idea, which in fact I was already sort of working on mentally anyway when I started writing Good Squad, which is kind of a, it's a, I think, a historical novel set in New York in the 30s and 40s, at least in part. And so, um, I guess the point I'm at now is just the point of generating material, which for me is very much what actually reveals what the story is. And one thing I found at the beginning with other books is that there's often a kind of hangover from the previous book. So I, I remember this really vividly when I was working on The Keep, because it was, it was a gothic thriller, I knew that, and yet I was trying to use a voice that was sort of like the voice of Look at Me, which was kind of urban and a little sardonic, and basically that voice would find this gothic material kind of stupid and that was really <laughs> coming through yeah. so it, it, the voice seemed to be saying the subtext seemed to be this is really dumb which is not really the message you want to be sending <laughs> to a reader um, so i was in agony and um and then there came a point where suddenly a totally different voice approach sort of emerged and it was such a relief and that was when i, I actually thought i can write this 
So I would say that I don't have a voice really for this new book and I'm finding, I, I think what I had thought was that it would be really fun to write a book set in the past but you know flowing back and forth to the present constantly. But that idea I think has been revealed as a kind of goon squad hangover. <laughs> and it actually, it's funny because it just doesn't work at all. Huh. It, it's, it's really, um, it's sort of lurching and, and dull when I've tried to do that. So I know some things that I'm not going to do. <laughs> now the question is, what am I actually going to do? Um, and I, I, you know, that's the point I'm at. I've certainly been here before, yeah. but it's never all that fun to feel like I'm sort of flailing around and not, not really getting at what I, what I want to do yet, or, and not even knowing. I remember you telling me that you, you often have a kind of central image or a kind of shape that, that helps you think about and or, organize a book. Do you, is there that for this next project yet? Not really, no. I think that's part of the kind of crystallizing of form that is a really good sign and a sign that there's, you know, there's a kind of cohesion happening. I really don't have that. And, and another sign of not having reached that point is that we talked about compression and like the suggestion of some, a larger shape. And what I often feel when things aren't really working yet is exactly the opposite. It's like I'm throwing tarps and nets everywhere, but I can't encompass what I'm trying to do. It's like an inversion of what you hope for, which is small things suggesting something much larger that you don't even need to say. And what I feel when things aren't working right is often a frantic um, evoking of, so of something big, but I can't even seem to get all the way around it, and, and I just end up using a lot of words. So it's, it's not a fun moment, but you know, I, I, you just have to get through it. That's, that's how it goes. You'll be in the shower one day soon. It'll, <laughs> it'll look hurt. I've been using a lot of hot water, <laughs> waiting for lightning to strike. <laughs> All right, well, well let me in, invite uh, our audience this evening to, uh, to ask any questions. There's some, I know there's a microphone up here, and I think there's one over here. And uh, if you we don't mind just coming to the front, and speaking your question into the microphone, just, uh, just line up and, and we'll get in as many as we can. Uh, you don't have to put your hand up, just walk up to the front if that's all right with you. Um, and since you're here, please go first. Um, you touched on sort of the giving up and you mentioned that your first novel was so horrible that you should have given up, I guess. I just want to know um, what, what kept you going and what sort of convinced you that you had to try at least one more time? You know, it's, it's, I should have mentioned that, actually. I'm glad you asked that. Um, with the first novel, what I, well, first of all, I didn't even read it for a year or two. Um, but when I did, and it was not fun, I felt that I had so utterly failed to realize the idea that I had had that the idea itself felt unscathed. I mean, it was, the idea had not failed. I had failed the idea. So I essentially just threw it in the trash and started over, and it became my first novel, The Invisible Circus, although not, I'm happy to say not a word uh -huh. of the original remains. But the idea, which was two sisters, you know, one growing up in the 1960s and one in the 70s, um, and the younger one trying to understand the suicide of the elder, that, and, and also really about those two eras, that, that felt still worth exploring. And so I went back to it. Uh, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, my question or questions briefly would be, what role does reading play in your process? Uh, if you write seven pages a day, do you then read in the afternoon or something like that? Um, and I guess the other question would be in terms of uh, contrariness or taking the other side you talked about in terms of having been robbed blah 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 how much is that part of your process in uh, terms of in terms of doing the opposite um, reading is extremely important I, I the time of day I don't I don't necessarily have too well organized and I, I always feel like I'm not reading enough but I usually feel like there that there is certain reading material that I need to read that will directly feed my project um, and with Goon Squad, actually, I think it, I, was, I had done a lot of that reading already, but in some way the book really was a direct response to Proust, which I read all the way through with, with some peers, having read a couple of volumes long before and, not, and gotten bored with it, basically, beyond a certain point. But I think it was, it was really In Search of Lost Time that made me want to um, tackle time as a subject and kind of curious about the ways that writers have tried to do that. Um, and then once I was actually working on the book, I think I was, my reading, well, the one thing was I really was interested in reading about 
the experience of being in the music industry. So I mentioned that book by Jacob Schlichter, and I read other things. Another one I really enjoyed was um, This Band Could Be Your Life, um, which was all about um, kind of a, the post-punk moment. It's not what I write about, but it, it was a it really great rendering of just this almost like subsistence level um, making of music. Um, okay, so that, so, and, and with, for example, with The Keep, I read tons of Gothic, really all the way through the Gothic literary tradition, um, from Matthew Lewis to Stephen King. Um, so there, there are often things like that. The second part of your question, oh, the, um, sort of going into the opposite part of a, of a transaction that I know from my point of view, I think the way in which I do, do that probably more than any other is that I'm very, I, I'm comfortable and even prone to writing from a male point of view. And I think it's for exactly that reason. I think it actually has become sort of a, a, a habit which means it needs to be broken because that's never a good reason to do something. Um, it shouldn't be too comfortable. And so, um, and, and with Goon Squad, I, I, I was very careful to make sure it was not more than 50% male, but I had to work to, to make that the case. So um, I think it's just for me easy, since I'm looking for a way out of my own experience, if I can find a way to, to move into a mind that's clearly not my own, it, it, that's very comfortable for me. Those are both good questions, but everybody else only gets one. So, so go ahead. Hi. Um, I, when I read um, the safari story in the New Yorker, I had, it was just such a spectacular experience. Like I felt this is so beyond just a short story. And you have been so, I, I just, it felt almost euphoric, like wow. And I was so thrilled to learn that it was part of, you know, a bigger piece. And you've, you've been so generous sharing about, you know, the, the, the pain of not being able to sort of find your way into something. But when you finished that, did you have that same feeling of like, wow, I just nailed that. Like, how did I do that? You know, it's funny, I really didn't with that one. I struggled a lot with that. And I had that, when I was just talking about like the tarps and the nets, um, I really had that feeling with that story for a while. And the key, the, the point at which I, and this is a perfect example of that, I could have walked away from that. But the reason I didn't was when I came up with this idea of Mindy, who's a, a woman in the story who's studying anthropology, finding these anthropological ways to organize her reality. And as soon as I latched onto that, I could feel compression finally happening because there was so much that could be explained that way that I didn't have to spell out. But I, I still remember bringing that piece into my writing group, actually, and reading it and thinking, I don't know what the hell they're going to say about this. Um, and, and feeling that it had more power than I had realized as I was reading it to them, but I, I didn't feel very confident. Yeah. Please. Hi. Uh, my question was also about Safari, which I like <laughs> very much. And um, the New Yorker version and the version in Goon Squad were a little bit different. And I was curious about which one came first and if there was any um, particular reason for the revisions. Yes. Um, basically, I had written it the way you see it in the book. But the New Yorker wanted, there were a lot of flash forwards in the story. Um, and right from the start, we're kind of moving many years into the future and, and sort of and seeing what happens to people. And at the end, that happens in a really big way. And we learn about the main characters and what's going to happen to them. The New Yorker felt that as a standalone story, those, those flash forwards were kind of um, obtrusive and even kind of a little heavy handed. And they really weren't comfortable publishing the story with them, only with the last one. So. I wrestled with that because I, I, felt, I felt that that last one almost becomes too convenient if we haven't set a precedent for doing that as one of the narrative techniques of the piece. Like, you know, what could be easier than just telling what happens to everyone at the very end? But if you know that this is a story where the present is infused with a sense of the future all the way through, it, that last big um, leap seems more earned, but they felt very strongly about it, and I knew that my I was going to publish it my way a few months later. So I cut all of it except that last one for their version. Great, thank you. Question. For 
First of all, you're just so wonderful to listen to, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. you. Um, my question pertains to this really beautiful and seemingly optimistic process you describe, with almost like this compulsion to do something and not really understanding why you're doing it, and then like with the PowerPoint. And then after you're done, you're like, oh, that's what I meant. And it, it, it almost seems to me like this marriage of like unconscious and, and conscious and like father figure over, I mean, I'm getting way too Freudian, but like, I'm not a therapy, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, how do you view that? It's almost like the old fashioned muse that's kind of forcing you to do things. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, the feeling is, I, I, I definitely consciously am aware of using my unconscious all the time, because I, it, I think what it really comes down to is that the ideas I have consciously are often not that interesting. I wish it were otherwise. <laughs> but you know, the, the kind of idea that I have consciously is, why don't we let a corporate person tell their story in, corp in PowerPoint? It's not that interesting. It's too obvious. So that's sort of the level I'm working on if I'm just sitting down and thinking, what should I write? So my whole process is geared toward unleashing some part of me that thinks more in a more interesting way. And when I write, I often don't, I mean, I really don't know what is going to emerge, and that's the fun of it. It's kind of a thrill. It's a little like reading. Of course, it often doesn't work, and then that's really unpleasant. But I, the, the way I like it to be is that the writing is sort of one step ahead of me, because if I'm ahead of it, then I'm back, I'm in control, and that's not gonna lead to really good stuff. And the power of the unconscious is amazing. As one example, with that first chapter, I had not realized when I wrote it that Sasha and Alex are the same name. And the book begins and ends with those two. Sasha is a nickname for Alexander. So, you know, could I have thought of that? No way. <laughs> but thank God it was in there somewhere. <laughs> well, you did. Yes, go ahead. What I get from that is ideas that I, I can't think of myself. What I lose is a, a real sense of control in the generating of the material. So what the experience I have more often is a sense that it's happening. For example, in Safari, in the example I gave earlier, there was, as I kept slogging away, there came this moment where Mindy began to talk about structural relationships. And as soon as I wrote it, I felt a kind of quickening and I, but I didn't know that would really solve my problem and make the story work, but I just had a sense that I had, you know, of course we're all, I'm stuck with metaphors here. So, I, I mean, I was about to say I was in a groove, but I think I've got to do better than that. Um, you know, I had a sense that something interesting was happening, and I'm just looking and waiting for that feeling. And when I get it, I try to push further in that direction. But it is really a feeling of kind of moving through a room with no light and just trying to find the openings and, and move through them. Um, I, we're running a little low on time. I apologize. We're just going to take two more questions, if that's all right. We'll take one here and the next one there. Um, you touched up on this a little bit earlier, but when you said, when when you first structured the stories, when you went backwards in time, it felt flat. So we were interested in, you know, if you could explain more and how, how you decide to reorder the pieces so that it worked, it became more alive. I would just say that I'm also happy to answer questions in book, yeah. signing books after this event. Um, it really was, I mean, it, it felt flat in the sense that it was not gathering momentum as, the, as I went through it. I mean, with a, with a book that's more conventional, the story is evolving. So you can say, well, now I know more than I did and I still want to know what's going to happen. I couldn't really evaluate the success of this in that way since it was moving backwards and we already knew it was going to happen. But all I knew was that I was getting kind of bored and restless reading it, which is not the feeling I want to have. And I think it really came down to what I said before, which is the book, I think to the extent that it works for anyone, is, is very much about the satisfaction of a kind of lateral curiosity. And that was certainly what pulled me through it in the writing. But I somehow thought that, I, that it needed to have this cr chronology, if backwards, um, in the end result. But in doing that, I was in a way undercutting and undermining all of the excitement that had led me through it. And, and so, you know, having seen that that really didn't work, I just tried to replicate to some degree the satisfaction of my own curiosity. Although I didn't, I didn't put the stories in the order that I had written them. But I tried to think carefully, 
about what would be the most fun and interesting and startling for the reader to encounter having just read what he or she had just read. And that was, it, it really was no more scientific than that. All right, so last question. Please make it a good one. <laughs> um, Don't I listen to him. <laughs> I wonder how your, your agent or your editor responded when you uh, send in a book that was so genre breaking or uh, experimental. Did you get a lot of, uh, you know, kind of pushback or? I worried that I would because the keep had done pretty well and it was, you know, a very, in a way, sort of a high concept, you know, you say gothic thriller and it evokes something. Um, as I was working on this, I thought, everyone's gonna be really disappointed that I'm doing this. Um, but that didn't stop me because I was having fun and there's, you, you can't turn your back on that. I mean, I knew that trying to do something else would, would never work, like I was excited about it. But when I gave a few chapters to my agent, I found that she, she absolutely took them on their own terms and said, it's fun, I'm really enjoying it. I think the publisher entered into it in the same spirit. I was paid much less for it than I had been for the keep. I think, I mean, well, also it was by then 2009. <laughs> so, um, you know, different times. But I think the feeling was, you know, this probably won't sell all that well, but it's, it has its merits and, and we'll get it out there. And honestly, that's what I thought too. So I think we were all seeing it. I, it wasn't like I felt that I wasn't being properly appreciated. I thought, you know, I'm, real, I'm a realist too. If you can't describe the book you're writing without people glazing over, <laughs> you know that that problem is not going to end when the book comes out. It, it's very hard for word of mouth to function when as soon as you start describing a book, people get bored. So I knew that was a problem. Um, and, and just as a, t a corollary, when I, when I gave the PowerPoint to the editor and agent, having promised them light revisions, I also waited for a bomb to drop. I mean, I just thought, no one is going to be happy to see this. <clears throat> but again, they really did take it on in a very enthusiastic way, even though from the publishing standpoint, it made the book more expensive. It was a production headache from beginning to end. And to this day, it, I mean, the big irony is you, it looks terrible on e-readers. And there's uh -huh. been such anger over that. I mean, I've received angry letters. I was, in, I was at the publishing house uh, two weeks ago. We're, we're looking at new models for it. I have it on my website in color with sound, and we're trying to figure out how to let <laughs> e-reader people know that. So they won't be so mad because can you imagine they have to buy the physical book to read the PowerPoint and they can't figure out why and I don't really blame them. Well, the worst things that could happen to you. Um, and I do, speaking of the physical book, I want to remind everybody that they're on sale here and if this hasn't persuaded anybody to, uh, to buy it, I don't know what will. Um, and if you already have read it, buy it for someone else. Um, I want to just conclude by saying that uh, among the many, many ways in which I am an admirer of Jennifer Egan, uh, her uh, open and fascinating way of talking about her own work really, really impresses me. So, thank thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you.